One of the big questions that people ask is why does a cord blood infusion, when used in the context of treating leukemia, why does Gravers' host happen sometimes? Whereas when cord blood is being used for regenerative purposes, you do not see Gravers' host, or it has not been reported yet. And for regenerative purposes, what I mean by that is treatment of conditions where you do not first destroy the immune system of the patient. So let me just um, take a step back and explain. Usually, cord blood is used clinically in the U.S. as a substitute for bone marrow transplantation. You use bone marrow transplantation or cord blood when a patient has leukemia or a hematological malignancy, and what you do is you give very high doses of radiation and chemotherapy to destroy the recipient immune system, and then you transplant the new cells in. So this is completely different than administering cord blood for example, to somebody who has liver failure or heart failure, because in that sense, you're just using the cord blood as a source of regenerative cells and cytokines they produce. So, how do we know that, in general, the cord blood does not induce Gravers' host when you put it into a patient that has an immune system? We know that because cord blood used to be used um, in World War II as a source of hemoglobin, uh, just transfusion when they ran out of blood, and nobody reported Gravels' host disease. We also know that cord blood was used um, in Africa and in India. Also has uh, many publications talk about uh, being used, even 32 cord blood bags have been used, allogenic, non-matched, and no Gravels' host disease. And also we know that, that, that the cells that do cause Gravels' host disease are lymphocytes, when you transfer them allogenically into somebody who has an immune system, for example, from uh, fathers whose um, wives are, um, undergo spontaneous abortion, those, uh, the, the wives do not get Gravels' host disease. So, again, just to emphasize the fact, a lot of times when you transplant cord blood, as you can see in the picture, into somebody who has been immunodeficient, then you can get Gravels' host. When you transfer it into a full compartment where there are cells already, lymphocytes already in the recipient, you don't see it. It has not been reported to Gravels' host. Now, how does this work? Um, well, the idea is that the immune system, and there's numerous publications talking about this, the immune system regulates the number of lymphocytes that it has in circulation. So it's like a balance. In the normal situation, there are chemicals, cytokines, being made by various cells of the body, like the stroma. They produce interleukin-7 and interleukin-15 at, at a constant rate, which gets uh, absorbed or sucked up by lymphocytes. They call them cytokine sinks. So basically, T cells and NK cells have receptors for these cytokines, and there's a balance. Now, what happens is when you have this balance, to activate the T-cell, the T-cell requires two signals when everything is balanced. It requires a T-cell receptor activation, so it recognizes something, and then it needs a co-stimulatory signal, a backup signal, to tell it, yes, this is something that you need to kill or you need to be activated against. Now, that's a normal situation. After you deplete lymphocytes, what happens is, you don't have the sink anymore, the things that uh, suck up the cytokines being made by the stroma. So you have a lot more cytokines, a lot more interleukin-7 and a lot more interleukin-15. What that causes is it causes the T-cell to be able to be activated with less T-cell receptor signaling. So things that before it couldn't recognize, it starts to recognize, which you can imagine is dangerous. Also the backup, the, the co-stimulation, it doesn't require co-stimulation if there's too much interleukin-7 and interleukin-15. So what this causes is a situation of when you have two little lymphocytes, the lymphocytes that you do have, they become hyperactive and they can attack different things that normally they wouldn't, such as when they're do causing graft versus host. So, how do we know this? We know this, this is pretty much uh, immunological dogma when you the lymphoid deplete, when you take down the number of lymphocytes, the ones left over become more hyperactive. We know this because if you reduce lymphocytes before doing transplantation between mice that under conditions that normally would allow acceptance of a foreign graft, 
transplantation tolerance. It's very difficult to achieve transplantation tolerance if you first deplete or substantially reduce the number of lymphocytes. Secondly, we know it because animals are prone to autoimmunity. When you reduce the lymphocytes, autoimmunity comes faster. And also a lot of patients who have autoimmunity, there's an argument made that, there, uh, that there's a lymphopenia before the autoimmunity happens. And the third point is in cancer studies, when you, in, in, when you have cancer and you first deplete the lymphocytes and then you put in lymphocytes or you let the lymphocytes rebound and vaccinate during the rebound, you get anti-tumor immunity. So, here's where things get interesting. There was a paper that came out. And the paper, I'm not going to go through the whole paper, but what the paper is saying essentially is that it's not just the process of depleting the lymphocytes that makes these hyperactive cells. It's also the fact that you're using radiation that makes cells hyperactive. So, what they did is they took mice that do not have an immune system. So these are a gamma chain knockout. They don't have T cells, B cells, or NK cells. And in these mice, they put a small number of T cells that react against a tumor. So what this exactly does is it gives, you, it gives us a system to look at the T cells becoming hyperactive. Now, remember, the mouse has no immune system. So if you give radiation to the mouse before putting the T cells, if there's an uh, augmentation of immune function, that augmentation is not because of lymphopenia, because there are no lymphocytes to begin with. So let's look at the data. As you can see, um, on the, on the y-axis is the tumor growth. And if you give the tumor to the mouse and you don't do anything, the tumor grows really uh, rapidly and the mouse dies. If you give a radiation to the mouse, but don't give tumor-killing lymphocytes, the tumor grows really quickly. If you give the tumor-killing lymphocytes to the mouse, you can see that there's some inhibition of tumor growth, but the tumor growth still grows. If you give radiation and then give the lymphocytes, there is a profound inhibition of the tumor growth. So this is very, very interesting data. Is it real? Well, then they looked at um, something called vitiligo, autoimmunity against the skin. Usually when you put T cells that attack, this is a melanoma, they also cross-react with healthy skin. So as you see in the figure, they also got vitiligo being enhanced when you give the radiation. So it's not working through lymphopenia. How else could it be working? Well, radiation is known to affect the colon. So they looked at the colon and they saw an increased pathology score. So it seemed like the radiation was doing some damage to the colon. If there was damage to the colon, maybe the bacteria in the colon are translocating. So then, as you can see in this figure, they actually saw in the mice that were irradiated an increased number of LPS, endotoxin, in the serum. So they're thinking that uh, something's going on here with the bacteria being released and it causing um, uh, by the endotoxin to go on circulation. When they looked at the dendritic cell activation, so dendritic cells get activated by endotoxin, they saw a lot of dendritic cells in the spleen, in the lymph node, and they saw increased interleukin-12, which is made by dendritic cells and stimulates T-cells. So now they ask the question, if the radiation is inducing some kind of bacterial translocation, and that bacteria is associated with the increased anti-tumor effect, what if you take away the bacteria? So they pre-treated the mice with antibiotic, with, with uh, Cypro, and as you can see, in the mice that were treated with Cypro, when you give the radiation, there's an inhibition of the number of dendritic cells going into the spleen, and there's an inhibition of interleukin-12, meaning that that immune modulation was associated with the bacteria. Now, in the critical experiment, what happens if you first pre-treat with antibiotic and then, and then you immunize, and then, and then you um, give the anti-tumor lymphocytes after a radiation? Well, the antibiotic inhibited, as you can see in this figure, com compared to control, the antibiotic inhibited the ability of the injected lymphocytes to kill the tumor. So, in conclusion, this paper is saying something very interesting, which is radiation can induce bacterial translocation. Number two. The paper is saying that the radiation, the, the bacterial translocation and the LPS is critically involved in anti-tumor immunity.